go to Baltimore and I'll be speaking there to several hundred lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgenders. Um, I'm sure somehow it will get to Rome. Someone will hear about it. And they will not be in the least bit happy because, you know, the Pope has been so strong and so frequently on this subject. And I'll be reminded that I took an oath of, of fidelity to the Pope. So how can you do this? Um, yeah, I, I mean, the only reason they might not say too much is because they've given up on me already. You know, he's, he's, he's a rebel, a heretic, a what have you. Uh, but the pressure on any other bishop would be very, very heavy. Uh, yeah, he would be strongly reminded of oaths of fidelity. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have no worries about it. I, I, I believe that what I'm doing is right. I, I, I believe that gays have received a very bad time, a raw deal within the church altogether. And they need someone to to speak to them, to you know, to hold out a hand, to to be a bit more Christian. But it'll be interesting to see what happens. I decided when I discovered the Shoah, when I discovered the Holocaust, that I could do nothing about the past. Yeah. But I could do something about the future. Yeah. And that applies to anybody who is discriminated against. And as far as gays and lesbians are concerned, who cares? As long as they are loving, I think that is the main, the main issue that you do not use other people, you do not abuse them, and you act lovingly. And that is what I really like about your, your current book, the little book. Yeah. Um, it is, the focus is on um, love. The, the love's urgent longings. Yes. Yeah. I saw what you were going to say to them. You've read that? Yes, I've read the piece yeah, yeah. you sent me, which I put on, uh, yeah. online. I was going to ask you, I thought you'd have read it, but do you have any Anything, comedy, you know, anything you, you think oh, I ought to change before I give it? I see nothing. I think it is just exactly the right thing to say. Okay. Because the focus is not on the mechanics yeah. of sex, yeah. but on the person. importance of loving and yeah. caring. The persons in reality don't think that, that the magisterium any longer thinks in terms of procreation. I think the issue is papal authority. Mm -hmm. And popes can't be wrong and so popes of the past can't be wrong. And I think that's the question whether it's you're talking about sexuality, whether you're talking about the ordination of women or a host of other subjects. The popes of the past can't be wrong. Even if you're talking about clerical celibacy. The popes mm -hmm. of the past can't be wrong. And, and that's what I've called the prison of the past. Um, you know, the church put itself into a prison and threw away the key. And that's, I mean, I, I've said that, I'm quoting my own book, but I said that I could give up many rights and still live a good life. But one right I could not surrender is my right to be wrong. I need that right a hundred times a day. You know, sorry, I misunderstood. Sorry, I was insensitive. If I could never be wrong, well, uh, we can't. We couldn't exist. And I think a, not a, a church too needs absolutely needs that right to be wrong. That's how we all get on. We we make mistakes and then we say sorry, and then we change and we we move ahead. It's the only way to do things. But the church is in that bind now, they can't be wrong. And the Pope is always afraid if he admits he was wrong on one thing, that would cause a loss of all papal authority. 
And I think that's why they're not even looking at, at um, questions like ordination of women, gays, or you know, that, because it all comes back to the Pope can't be wrong. That's why I titled the book Confronting Power and Sex. Mm -hmm. It's got to be both. I think that's been a big part of the poor response to abuse is but we can't be wrong we can't you know say we've we've that wrong teachings have, have contributed in any way and i believe they have oh but to say no fidelity to the pope what happens if there is a conflict between my fidelity to the pope and my fidelity to god's people mm -hmm or fidelity to God. And I thought, no, excuse me, if that happens, then I've got to be faithful to God, I've got to be faithful to God's people. They, of course, would say that there can't be a conflict between fidelity to the Pope and fidelity to God's people, but, but there can. As you would know, as I most certainly know now, and, and that's why I'm not worried by that that oath. But um, it's there. Bishops do take it seriously. Well, I hope I did. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I do think we have to come to a point where we say, oh, no, there's, there is a higher fidelity. I said, what if one bishop proposed to all the bishops that before it goes to the Pope, they send it out, the, the voting, the questions, they send it out to every bishop in the world, asking them to vote by post. And do you know why that would be so significant? Because finally it would be an act of the entire college. And even a Pope has to listen to that. And it would be the beginning of, of a change, uh, and from which I, you know, one could hope that many other things could follow. But I mean, I'll be saying this in a few talks this year. The Pope doesn't want that, and the the case of the ordination of women is the proof of it. See, I don't. You may know this already, but what happened back there in the mid '90s. Um, was there was all this agitation for the ordination of women. The Pope didn't want it, again, because it would question the, the authority of Popes. So the issue was never the ordination of women. They didn't even get to it. It was the authority of the Pope. And instead what they did was write a document. And then the Pope wanted to give it authority. So what he did was invite to Rome the presidents of the bishops' conferences, just the presidents. And when they got there, they were presented with this document. And they were asked to endorse it in the name of all the bishops. And they said, thank God, we can't. Uh, because we haven't, you know, we can't speak for all the bishops. The good thing, of course, they all had to go home. <laughs> and if they'd had to go, come home and said, well, we endorsed it in your name, there would have been, you know, big problems. So they would not do it. Instead, they asked that two phrases be, be omitted. One was, auditis fratribus, you know, having heard our brothers in the Episcopal. Mm -hmm. They asked that that be deleted. They said, because you haven't. And then they also asked that the word irreformabilis, irreformable, uh -huh. be omitted. Not quite infallible, but, you know, virtually the same mm -hmm. thing. They asked that that be omitted. So, what did the Pope do? He published the document with those words omitted, 
and then the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, who happened to be one Josef Ratzinger, uh -huh. then wrote a, a document saying that it really was infallible already. And he quoted particularly the unanimous support of all the bishops over 2,000 years. But can you see what that was? Those bishops had never been asked. And besides which, they were all dead, and so they couldn't <laughs> speak now. Um, you know, as you would know, most of those bishops of the past 2,000 years would have voted against the ordination of women over those 2,000 years. But their reasons would have been or all sorts of reasons, cultural uh, in many societies, but also, you know, the attitudes of many people of the past, as you, as you would well know, when you start reading some of the fathers of the church, mm -hmm. you find some of their statements about women, you know, are horrendous. And, and so it's no, it's hardly any surprise that they didn't, wouldn't have really been in favor of the ordination of women. But, you know, to, uh, to appeal to the dead po uh, bishops and not even ask the living ones, <laughs> it, you know, it is a joke. And it was, I felt it was, a, it was the death of collegiality. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if the Pope can put out an infallible statement without even asking the bishops, then infallibly, and sorry, then collegiality has no meaning whatsoever. And I felt that day was the, the death of collegiality. But then thinking further, it occurred to me, no, the Pope couldn't ask the bishops. And you know why? Because he couldn't guarantee that they would all support this ban on the ordination of women. And now, I don't know, I, I believe a majority would have supported him. Mm -hmm. But it would not have been all. I don't know how many would have opposed, but the whole point is the Pope didn't know either. And let's imagine, let's imagine that it had been two-thirds in favour and one-third against. How could the Pope put that out and say, here's an infallible teaching? The Catholic world would have said, excuse me, Catholic teaching and one in every three of your own bishops doesn't agree with it? And that would be, that would look Ridiculous, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, maybe it was three quarters uh, would have voted for it. Maybe it was 80%. But if you've still got any sort of percentage on top who don't agree, how can you possibly call it infallible? To, get, to, to, to call it infallible, you'd need a minimum, it seems to me, of what, 95%? Before you can call it infallible. Mm -hmm. And I think the Pope knew he wasn't going to get that. So he wasn't going to ask. And I think that's in all these questions, he's not going to ask the bishops because he can't guarantee their answer. You know, changing sexual morality. No, he can't guarantee their answer. Too many would say, you know, agree with what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. No, it's much better to base this on persons and relationships rather than on the physical act. Um, you know, I think a lot of bishops, I, look, I'll tell you something, um, we once had a meeting of, uh, or it was about 15, perhaps, maybe 15 up to 20, something like that, bishops from Australia and New Zealand. And, and I asked a question or two about sexual morality, things like, uh, do you still believe that... Uh, Every sexual sin is a mortal sin, such that even taking pleasure in thinking about sex for two seconds is a mortal sin. Now, two, two of them just kept quiet and didn't say a word. But the other 15 or so said, no, we don't believe that. Which is a, not a bad indication that if the Pope actually asked the bishops some questions about sexual morality, You'd get large, you know, particularly once you started getting into things like that, you know, the questions I just asked. Do you believe every mortal sin is, every sexual sin is mortal? Do you believe even thinking about it for two seconds is a mortal sin? Uh, they'd say no. And then at that point, the whole sort of sexual morality would be 
in, in debate, would be up for question. You'd have to pull back it, and that would mean popes were wrong. And that's what can't happen. So you, you see why I, I now, in my thinking, think that everything comes back to papal authority. That's why Pope Paul VI decided the way he did in uh, Humane Vitae, on contraception. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the argument, the ultimate argument is the popes can't be wrong. Uh, the popes, you know, 2,000 years of popes can't be wrong. Therefore, we can't change on contraception, we can't change on celibacy, we can't change on sexual morality, we can't change on ordination of women, etc. And it's to such an extent that the actual issues are not even considered. No one, for example, on contraception, no one talks about contraception in itself any longer. Catholic people have made up their own minds. Bishops have made up their own minds. And the only question, if you ever raise it, you're straight back to papal authority. This is why I, you know, I insisted that it's got to be power and sex where we need the changes. And I do believe they are a significant contributors to the whole sexual abuse issue. Uh, I believe that that teaching on sex is positively unhealthy and yet a lot of the priest offenders grew up under that. Um, and when you've got you know, something as unhealthy as all of that, that's not going to lead to a mature sexuality. And I think it was a contributing factor to the fact, I mean, I've, I've met people not, who, who, who have effectively said to themselves, some young people, you, you can't live up to that. You can't follow all that teaching exactly as it is. Um, so you might as well. Yeah. Anyway, this is the way I'm thinking on a lot of these subjects. It, it, it does all come back to that papal authority and that prison of the past. We, 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 we've got to admit that we can be wrong on most things, mm -hmm. on everything almost. Um, it, it, it's just part of life. And it's a terrible, terrible, impossible bind to get into to say, no, on these matters, the Pope can't be wrong. That can't be wrong. That's where you get this creeping infallibility. <laughs> I like that expression. Yes, it is, but it's so true, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the issue is not the formal bits of infallibility. The in, the the real issue is how much papal prestige has been invested in a particular teaching. So that even the celibacy of priests, it's, it's, you know, it's a law, it's not a solemn teaching, it's only a law. But there's been so much papal prestige put into it that there can't be change. It's the celibacy that, you know, a priest wakes up a year or two after his ordination and, and finds that the celibacy is unwanted, unaccepted and unassimilated. And then that's dangerous. It can lead to a lot of different problems, one of which is, is the problem of abuse. In, in the Catholic Church, there is, there are, you know, I, I love that phrase of Newman. There is nothing on this earth so ugly as the Catholic Church and nothing so beautiful. And, and I believe, I believe both sides of that. I believe that there is terrible ugliness. And it's the ugliness I want to see collapse. I don't want to see the entire church collapse the way apartheid did. But I do believe that the day's got to come when 
you know, when the whole church comes to realize you can't live that way. You, you, it's much healthier to admit we can be wrong and so we can fix problems. Are we going to? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't tell you. But, I, I mean, obviously I can tell you if we don't, then I very much fear for the, uh, the future of the church because people will leave it in great numbers as they are now. You know, they, well, it's already happening, isn't it? In large numbers of people just saying, I don't believe that, I don't want to be part of that. And that will continue. I mean, they've got lots of excuses that you know, new numbers are coming into the church in Africa and Asia and, what, and so we, we, don't, we don't worry about the, but, you know, they've got to pay attention to it sometime. That, that's another phenomenon of, you know, the, the conservatives, uh, those who do accept that system, uh, now coming into positions of power. Yes, it's a... It's a very worrying, I, I, I feel, you know, after all this time, I, I feel an outsider in, the, in many ways in the church. I had a wonderful professor when I was at the gymnasium in Innsbruck back in the 1950s, Anton Egger, whom I mentioned a few places online. And he, felt exactly the same way toward the end of his life. He died a few years ago in his late 80s. And he also was very, very angry with the previous pope. Of John Paul. Of John Paul. Yeah. He, he believed that he destroyed, was in the process of destroying the process made in Ver by Vatican II, yeah. that John Paul had, was more dangerous to the future of the church, particularly because he was looked at as something like a saint by so many, because he was a good man, but he was not the one who followed the call of Vatican II, and in a way destroyed, was in the process of destroying the process, the progress that had been made. He was a contradiction. He did wonderful things. Mm -hmm. He had great, great strengths. Um, but nobody's perfect. And to put him up as perfect was very dangerous. Um, you know, he, he, yes, he undermined the council terribly. Um, you know, that, that story about the ordination of women, that was all his time, mm -hmm. which is almost a conscious decision. We can't trust the bishop, so we won't ask them. Um, you know, killing off collegiality. Um, he did nothing about the abuse crisis. And yet he was the one It arose during his time, and he did nothing. He wrote one very weak, poor letter to the bishops of this country, but it was a very poor letter, and that was in 1992. Otherwise, he did nothing. Uh, in other words, he failed before the, the major moral crisis to hit the church in his time. And that's saying something big, isn't it? When a pope mm -hmm. failed to meet the biggest moral crisis challenge of his time as pope. And yet he did, he failed, there's no other word for it. Anything that's happened, and that isn't much, has happened under Benedict. At the same, at least been better. Yeah, at the same time, I am suspicious that Benedict was never in support of Vatican II. And he's now doing, finally, what I think he's been wanting to do all along. Well, as you well know, there's, there's Ratzinger I and Ratzinger II. <laughs> And people yeah. love quoting Ratzinger I again, but you know, really, it's it's sort of so outdated now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He 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 would say 
he had a big change of heart. He puts down the year 1967, coming out at the time, and, and saying, oh, you know, please, Joseph, how can you do this? You're, you're too good a theologian to, to write this nonsense. But he'd done it. And, and that, that upset me because I, I, it is bad theology to quote the, the dead popes against the living ones. Well, I think you have the answer, the power part. Yes, but it's, it's sad to see a, a good man corrupted. And, and that, I mean, you know, well, I wouldn't know his inner motives. He'll answer to God for it, not me. Um, but, but that one, I really, I, I did feel he'd come close to, you know, selling his soul for, for out of loyalty, a misguided loyalty to, to the Pope. So what do you see as your task? Not much. I can't change the church on my own. I'm, I'm not a Nelson Mandela. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't do much. I, I, I'm giving this talk now. That will be the first time for a few years that I've done anything really you know, outrageous, and we'll see what the uh, we'll see what the response is. The biggest church is the Catholic Church. The second biggest is ex-Catholics. After that come Baptists and, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a figure. What is it? Ten, twenty million ex-Catholics in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, to try to mobilise them is difficult, because many of them say, you know, I've, I've thrown that out. I'm not going back there. Mm -hmm. uh, they've left in disgust or in despair, or, and then the young are leaving in vast droves. Uh, I don't know about the church here, but the church in Australia, if it weren't for the migrants, we'd be in desperate straits. It's the migrants who keep it alive. Mm -hmm. Well, they may, but their children won't. Their children will grow up you know, and adopting many of the ideas of others around them. And, uh, you know, the people I talked to, say, in that tour, you know, four years ago or this time, mm -hmm. they'll be mainly elderly people who are upset by the church but not going to leave it. Uh, but they've all got the same story. My children never go to church anymore. And isn't that sad after, you know, we put them through schools and all the rest of it. And, this is one, and, and, and you know, you were mentioning this, the, the, the conservative priests getting in. It, it's 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 a trend. It's the church is becoming smaller and more conservative. You know, consisting only of those who are in certain positions of power, who who do follow that papal line. Now, something I, I don't think that can go on forever. See, you mentioned technology, but what really changed before the technology was that in the West. Catholics became more educated. They, they went much further in schooling than in the past. They went to university. And, and that started them thinking. And they wouldn't take, would no longer accept, you know, being humble, obedient servants. Yes, Father, yes, Father. Uh, education achieved that. Now the technology has come on on top of it to give this marvelous, you know, means of communication. But I think the education came first, and that was the, the really important one. Um, I, I, I don't know where all this is going to end and how it will end up. I do believe that the day will come somehow that when there's change, it will be dramatic. It will be a, a, a collapse, as it were. Well, maybe the only thing that's going to collapse, though, is, in a sense, the bad part. Oh, yes, I don't want the good part. That's yeah. not, you know, I do have a fear that when the bad part collapses, as it were, the lot will collapse. And that would be, I, I, I don't want to see that at all. I mean, there's so many good things happening. 
You know, some of the nuns here are beautiful people and they're doing their very best. And you, you know, you can meet that anywhere you go. I mean, the, the, there are several issues that any one of them could... Uh, another big one is, is uh, original sin. See, yeah. if you read, as I'm sure, of course you have, um, you know, the Council of Trent, mm -hmm. it, it's all based on Adam and Eve. But now we know Adam and Eve is a story, a good story, a powerful story, a rich mm -hmm. story. But it's a story, it's not, you know, what happened. And yet Trent is really based on, on the idea that this is what happened. And, and yet... It, you know, if you, how can you have original sin if you had no original parents to commit the sin? Um, and and it even they go so far as death entered the world through the sin of Adam and Eve. Well, excuse me, but we now know death was there a very long time beforehand. I mean, an issue like that could come up and could could theoretically cause people to say the Pope was wrong. And well, in one sense, the problems we have now are, are only 140 years old. Mm -hmm. Because that's when infallibility was declared. And that was the step too far altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, from that moment on, there had to be a collapse of, of that system. So how do we save the good? How do we? Save the good part. Oh. We really have to see something of that collapse before you can. Uh, you know, there has to be an admission that popes have got this, that or the other, they've got it wrong. And that in that system would have to go. Um. <clears throat> you know, as I say, uh, any one of those issues could bring it about. Perhaps, perhaps original sin is a much better Mm -hmm. Much better hope than anything to do with sex, because that gets so emotional. <laughs> Whereas at least we can, you know, sit back and be a bit more objective about uh, the story of Adam and Eve, and we can all come to agree now. Uh, uh, it didn't happen. That's a story, and see the richness of that story by all means. Yes, that would be good, but not not see it as literal fact. And if we could all admit that was wrong, therefore. Trent was wrong, therefore councils and popes are not infallible. Then a whole lot of good things could follow. So maybe that is the issue to, to uh, you know, develop. But it's, it's a bit hard, possibly. Well, it is also much bigger than the Catholic Church. Yeah. That issue is one that affects all of Christianity. Um, yes, it affects all of Christianity. Uh, it depends. I'm not sure what other, how far other churches have committed themselves there. Uh, I would suspect they're even more committed because much of the Protestant Reformation was based on that particular issue yeah. and on the definition of humans and the evil. Uh, well, I mean, that comes into it in the sense that if you do say Adam and Eve is a story, it didn't happen, mm -hmm. and death came long before that, etc. You still have to explain how evil came into the world. And that's a massive theological mm -hmm. question that will never go away. It's a very real question. It's just that you could no longer use the sin of Adam and Eve as the explanation, because it isn't. I, I don't know. There's a, there's a book out just very recently by a man named uh, a priest, Mahoney or Mani, uh, on this whole question of, um, uh, of evolution. Uh, but I, 
I've also seen a critique of it, which seemed to have some valid points. So maybe that that dialogue has to go and and, and you know to come out more and get more people involved and seeing that that's where maybe the internet needs to come in. Uh, but the, yeah, it, it is a big question. So to go back to you, I think you have probably a bigger role than you think. And in a way you're called to, to speak out. And I think you're doing it. <laughs> How many more bishops do you think that actually agree with you? Without having to admit it, <laughs> that's, that's, you know, there are there. Are, I mean, I could name several in Australia who would be in sympathy with a lot of what I say. Doesn't mean they'll agree with every word. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, the limits to what I can, uh, that book has been quite severely criticised as lacking in theological depth. And, you know, where are the footnotes and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, oh yes, I've had, you know, quite a lot of criticism. Mm -hmm. And, say, when you come to a question like original sin, I mean, sure I know enough to know that Adam and Eve is a, is a story, not a, a fact, but I'd be out of my depth if I started, you know, really getting into questions of of, of the origin of evil, and um, you know, this needs this needs professional theologians. Remember, I'm a canon lawyer. That's that's what mm -hmm. I was made to study when I was young. So I have ideas about you know how you could introduce collegiality, and how you know the different forms it could take. And that would be my field, actually. You know, now I'd, I'd know what I was talking about. But as I've explained to you, the Pope doesn't want infallibility, doesn't want collegiality, because he can never guarantee what the bishops will say. So the movement really is run from absolutism yes. toward democracy. Well, I'm always hesitant about the word democracy. Uh, could we uh, call it something else? Yes, participatory government mm -hmm. or something like that. You know, democracy unfortunately has come to mean a popular vote and a popular vote by people who haven't necessarily spent two seconds thinking about yeah. the issue. So you could have to tell and the majority. Know, so do I want people just voting on original sin? No. <laughs> no, I, I, I want a much more gradated the, the systems that I've worked on or thought about. You know, I'd love to see a council. Uh, it is time for one, because there are so many issues. Uh, not, not, not like Vatican II, where you, you discussed everything. No, it would be select questions. But there would be some, I think there are nearly 5,000 bishops now. <clears throat> and I would therefore have 10,000 other people. I'd look for people who had done a course in theology, uh, I'd hopefully a minimum of say three years, if we couldn't get enough then at least a minimum of two years. So not just anybody off the street, but people who've done studies like that. I'd work it all through computers, see, your technology. They don't mm -hmm. need to come together in Rome this time, and in fact they couldn't, it would be too expensive and too unwieldy mm -hmm. to bring 15,000 people to Rome and have a a council like the last one. So I'd do it all through computers. And you could. Uh, and you could, if there were to be meetings, they could be more local. You know, the members of that council from California might get together actually and talk. But largely it would be through computers. And then I would bring in the theological societies, the biblical societies. I'd ask them, you know, we'd determine the questions and then I'd go to them and say, sorry, I'd want the Pope to go to them and say, well now give us your view and your voting on, on these particular 
uh, issues uh, and then you know disseminate material through the computer through the internet and then have these 15,000 people vote it can be done but you've got to want it to, to do it that's the problem yeah, I mean we'd, we'd have to do it in a church fashion I mean I, I, I don't want democracy in the sense of you know we decide by a democratic vote whether we believe in God or not that's not how I'd want to do it and yet Winston Churchill's comment still true when he said that um, uh, yes democracy is a very poor form of government it's just that it's better than any other and uh, <laughs> ultimately that's true